Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, Michelle, are we good to go? Email from a late breaking amendment from the egg producers. They sent it to me, I sent it to Adam. I Mr. Chairman, was late breaking a play on words? We're talking about unintentionally so. Uh, Michelle just said we could go. But it, it, it's, it scrambled the policy outcomes here. <laughs> well played, well played. <laughs> um, Michelle says, Good. That, uh, this egg is poached. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, I, I'll stop this madness. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the T T Transportation Environment Committee this afternoon. Um, today, today, we'll be discussing Bills 3220 and 3320, both. <laughs> are sponsored by Council President Katz at the, re at the request of the executive. These bills were introduced back on July 21st as an effort to continue our uh, re help, uh, to help us reach our waste reduction goals. Ms. Myhill will walk us through the issues listed in her packet and then we'll make recommendations on each bill. Um, bill 3220 would require the executive to develop by method one regulation, an ongoing waste reduction program and prohibit the distribution of single use straws for exceptions and Bill 3320 would prohibit the use of polystyrene food product, food service products, or food service businesses, require the use of compostable or recyclable food service ware by the county, and prohibit the sale of polystyrene loose fill packaging. Um, and I should just highlight the leadership of my uh, colleague, uh, Councilmember Reamer, uh, on this issue in particular, who was well ahead of his time in 2014 when he started our county's conversation about plastic reduction with legislation that um, recognized the urgent lead to the need for all of us to reduce plastic foam and other products um, while being responsive to our restaurants and other businesses. Here we are six years later, we're, st we're still ahead of our time building on that work and I'm eager to have the discussion. Um, so thank you, Council Member Reamer, for six years of protecting our rivers and watersheds. Um, after those two bills, we'll hear a briefing from DEP regarding the uh, long-awaited National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, our MS4 permit. Thanks both to uh, Ms. Myhill and Mr. Levchenko for their very thorough packets as always, and thanks to DEP and everyone else for joining us today. Um, okay, and are we going to, we can get into Bill 3220 first. I will say that um, uh, I don't know, Amanda, if we want to do it before you or after, but I, before we begin, I was asked by Director Ortiz to allow Jules Sharkey of Founding Farmers and possibly other local businesses that had signed up and attended the full council hearing but were not allowed to speak to be given a few minutes to speak about that bill today. I think it'd be helpful for me at least and I hopefully my colleagues. Um, so, uh, Director Ortiz, do you want to introduce... Uh, yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, it, in, in uh, developing um, this legislation, we've had uh, close contact with the business community, um, folks who ended up not being completely aligned with what we have today, and then folks who actually we drew a lot of inspiration from. Um, you may be familiar with the Our Last Straw campaign uh, in Washington, D.C. It was launched several years ago, led by the industry, um, where uh, they passed a ban on plastic straws. Uh, one of the principal leaders was uh, Dan uh, Simons, who's uh, with uh, Founding Farmers. Uh, he's one of the uh, co-founders of, of Founding Farmers. He works very closely with Jules Sharkey. And uh, he's here today um, to speak uh, from his perspective, but I think he also represents the other restaurants uh, and restaurant groups and nonprofits that were involved uh, in, the, in the straw legislation. So I, I see that he's available, and I'm so pleased that he was able to make time again uh, to talk to uh, talk to the county council. Great. Are we able to uh, connect, Mr. Simons? Michelle, thank you. Let's see what happens here. Hey, we see you. Great. Thank you. Um, 
No, Mr. Chairman and other council members, thanks so much and, and staff and, and anybody else who's here who, who works on these issues and, and so many others. First of all, and I promise I'll be brief and how, how busy everybody is. Um, first of all, thank you, um, you know, for, for, for taking up environmental topics like this um, and, and making sure that businesses get a voice um, and frankly, making sure that not just the usual suspects who represent businesses get, get a voice. Um, you know, I'd, sub I'd submitted some um, written testimony, and, and so I won't read nor, nor repeat that. I, I want to sort of add some perspective to it. Uh, for me, probably the most important thing here is this perspective of um, what I think of as conscious capitalism. And when I say the usual suspects who represent business, I don't say that in, in any negative way. What I mean is that um, business associations sort of historically and by their nature have taken a position over time that, you know, sort of regulation is bad, unbridled, unregulated, unrestricted uh, capitalism is, is the answer. And so that, that's where you see the sort of typical advocacy line up. Um, I think that's just fundamentally wrong. I think it's fundamentally unnecessary. And I say that from a really optimistic perspective about the good that conscious capitalism can do. And, and while straws are, are uh, and plastics may seem like a tiny little issue, it represents this so well. And what I mean is that I'm a business owner. I'm, I make profit. I have investors, bankers, all, all of this stuff that I do, you know, on a daily basis. And I've been doing it for years and I employ people and I need to give raises and pay bills. And right now my restaurants are ruined. Um, you know, maybe not fully ruined, but COVID is devastating. And that doesn't stop the fact that other things are important, right? Food safety is as important as ever. The environment is as important as ever. And we have to be able to work on more than one issue at once. And so when you hear this message that now is not the time for more regulation, that's just so easy to say. And it sounds like such a defensible stance. And I understand why people worry about the optics. It's just not correct. Now is, of course, the time to do as much good and gain as much momentum on any important issue as ever is a good time. Why should we wait around? Is now not a good time to try to cure cancer, right? Like keep, keep going is my message. And so I represent a ton of restaurants. Julie Sharkey with our last straw, you know, we put together a coalition of hundreds of restaurants in DC and um, you can make profit and run your restaurants and serve your guests and battle COVID and deal with all of the restaurant destruction we're facing and make some shifts with regard to the materials that we use in things like straws, hopefully soon enough, other plastics, et cetera. And all of us, me included, are adding so many other plastics to the waste stream right now as we do all of this to go food and we don't get to use China silver glass and reusables because everybody wants it to go. So more now than ever, it's a good time. So pl please don't think that this is about sort of, uh, do-gooders on one side and, and business people on the other. I think that that old methodology really benefits one and only one constituency. And those are either the petroleum producers or the, you know, giant, you know, manufacturing conglomerates, by the way, all of whom will adapt and evolve um, with good regulation. So um, there are lots of restaurants that support what we're doing. We had a whole bunch of other folks lined up to speak, um, you know, which I know with scheduling wise can always be difficult. I do have some concern with PLA plastics. So I just wanted to mention that really briefly. Um, PLA plastic solves and addresses one side of this, which is it's good. They're not made from petroleum. And if that was our only concern, I'd say super. Um, but PLA plastics have a downside, which is when you throw them in the ocean or you drop them in the woods or in a stream, they behave just like petroleum based plastic. So on the litter and, and, the, and that side, you know, they're not a solution. So I'd love to see that sort of solved and addressed. And hopefully these comments, um, you know, are helpful. I'm happy to take any questions, but thanks so much for giving me the time to share my thoughts. Very helpful. Thank you. Mr. Ortiz, was that it? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, for uh, giving Mr. Simons the opportunity to speak on behalf of um, his community. Oh, my pleasure. I'm sorry we couldn't fit him in during the uh, very crowded um, hearing that day, I think. 
Um, Ms. Cow, great to see you as well. Um, Ms. Myhill, thank you again for your packet. Uh, do you want to walk us through? Can, can I? Oh. oh, sorry. Hans, please. I just wanted to thank Mr. Simons. I think he may have just turned off his camera. Dan, if you're still there, uh, there he is. Hey, um, thank you for your leadership. You know, it's not easy to be a leader in the restaurant sector and take a position that you know is the right position, but might contradict what the message is that's coming out from other parts of the sector. And so, um, you know, it's not everybody who'd be willing to step up like that. Uh, I, I've gotten to know you over many years working on a whole wide array of initiatives. And, um, you know, I think your, your style of restaurant is kind of right at the heart of what this region's flavor is. You know, it's innovative, it's local, it's creative, it's delicious, and um, just, you know, thank you. You're doing an amazing job, and we're here to support your your industry in any way that we can, uh, and 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 you. So thanks for being amazing. I, I wanted to thank uh, the chair for for observing that uh, you know the the statewide foam ban that was passed um, indeed uh, you know was previously passed here, and it was it was the chairman's great constituents in Tacoma Park who. The children of Tacoma Park, who really started that movement, and sure. you know there was, a, there was a school kids campaign to ban foam, right? The trays, uh, right. that kind of, with foam trays, yeah. and you know the, the, the Tacoma Park and acted that and inspired me. I you know kind of fought that and it was kind of control, but I think it has gone really well and. You know the straws issue. That's a kind of anyway. There's complicated. Uh, it hasn't been adopted. They aren't. You know, you're not have plastic straws as I understand it now. But uh, we can address that. But in any event, um, you know, I want to want to thank Cheryl Kagan, Senator Shake, Cheryl Kagan, and Delegate Brooke Learman for spreading Montgomery County's gospel to the rest of the state and and successfully passing that. Uh, legislation, um, you know, to bring this kind of approach more widely, uh, you know, to the rest of the, the state. But cutting down on litter has got to be, uh, you know, a high priority. And I think we've learned that trying to educate people about, you know, not doing it doesn't really hold a candle to just stopping the pollution at the source and, and you know, changing the materials that are used. Um, and, and that's a far more effective approach. Uh, to, to preventing it from getting in the waste stream. So again, Dan, great to see you. Uh, thank you for, for being here. I thank couldn't you. agree My more. Pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Simons. And you're, you're right, Hans, and not all litter is uh, created equal, obviously. So, you know, you drop a paper cup, it's one thing, eventually it's gonna break down. We're talking about stuff that doesn't break down for hundreds of years, so I'm glad we're having this conversation. But I didn't know that part of the history that I remember my constituents marching in Tacoma Park parades 15 years ago and 10 years ago uh, with foam trays trying to draw uh, attention to this issue. I didn't know that you had picked up on that to shape this bill. So that's really interesting and good to know. Yeah. Okay, okay. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, Mr. Glass. Sure, uh, just real quick, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate those comments from you and also from Council Member Reamer and just adding to it, you know, the work that has been done here in Montgomery County, uh, the, uh, the calorie information requiring restaurants to share calorie information, you know, the trans fats, uh, you know, there's a lot that, that our predecessors here on the council and in county government have done. Uh, and I think what uh, Dan has, has been able to do as, as has been noted uh, with, within the uh, adding to the innovation that his restaurants and his businesses have, have helped here in Montgomery County and in the DC region evolve on the culinary scene, uh, making sure that the businesses evolve as well. Uh, and that is my takeaway from his very poignant testimony. Uh, and I know that's the work that we're gonna do today because we can do two things at, at the same time. Uh, and as we see with the fires burning uh, out in the West and with uh, hurricanes continuing to pound uh, Americans on the Gulf Coast, uh, we can chew and walk, we can chew gum and walk at the same time, and we got to save the planet while making sure that we're all safe and protected from COVID too. Uh, so uh, I yield back, but uh, this is this is an important conversation. Thank you very much. Well said. Okay, Ms. Myhill, you're up. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. You um, gave a very good introduction to the bill. So unless there are specific questions, I'm just going to dive right into the issues that I raised in my packet, my staff report. Um, so I will start on the uh, bottom of the first page. As I noted, there's really two main uh, categories of changes uh, in Bill 32. One is uh, related to the ongoing waste reduction program, and the other is prohibiting the distribution of single-use straws with certain exceptions. And so I, that's how I grouped the issues. And um, there are really two that I raised related to the uh, the waste reduction program. And as um, as described in the bill and in the packet, the bill would require the executive to develop an ongoing waste reduction program. And under that program, um, the executive can, via method one regulation, uh, prohibit the use, distribution, or sale of certain products or materials that reduce the amount of waste generated and require the use of environmentally preferred products or materials instead of conventional alternatives. Uh, the first issue I raised, I think, is one of the biggest issues you'll likely talk about today is whether or not the executive should be given the authority to prohibit um, or to require certain actions in a method one regulation. Um, I have on page two put DEP's comments um, that are in responses that are in response to issues raised um, specifically from the Chambers of Commerce and the Restaurant Association. Um, and I'll let them speak for themselves, but essentially um, they are comfortable with the method one regulations and note that that's how the recycling law is crafted. And I agree with that, um, but the recycling law is um, quite tailored. It's not, um, it's not quite as broad as what this legislation would allow DEP to do. It's council staff's recommendation that, um, that either um, the bill be amended such that the plan or the program wouldn't be um, as deferential to the executive to allow these kinds of actions in a method one regulation or in the alternative, if that's the direction the committee wants to go, um, I really think that there should be additional specificity in the law to more guide what um, what could be in the ongoing waste pro reduction program. And okay. if it, depending on the direction the committee wants to go, if the committee mm -hmm. is comfortable leaving it as method one, but does want additional specificity um, after the session, I can work with uh, the department to um, to add additional guidance in the law. Okay. Collins, any comments on this? Yeah. yeah. Please, um, please. Thanks. So I want to just unpack this a little bit. Um, the, the proposal is to allow DEP to create a, a recycling, the waste reduction plan. And the, and, you're, and Amanda, you're saying that it could be separable. Uh, or it is separable, and then and then to it grants DP authority to make uh, additional, you know, to basically, uh, you know, prohibit certain materials. Would they have to be specified in that plan? Is that is that what the proposal is that we're receiving? That we have to receive this, and that that whole plan is that the method one regulation? Correct. They could. Um, just for instance, and DEP can correct me if I'm wrong, but for instance, the straws, um, they could have done that if this law was in place as drafted, as submitted, um, they could have done that via method one regulation as opposed to legislation. Um, and so what the bill does is it allows DEP to, um, to create substantial program requirements in a method one regulation. And typically, um, I'm not saying exclusively, but typically regulations are really the intent of those is to develop those in response to a law that has um, has significant and substantial parameters. And then the regulation is typically used to kind of flesh out the notes and bolts, but the parameters are put in the law. Um, the way that I read the law and the way that I see this is it's quite deferential to executive regulations without having the sufficient parameters in the law. Okay, well, maybe we could hear from uh, Director Ortiz, yeah. you know, okay, 
you want to just go to Director Ortiz now, Mr. Chairman? Or yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's hear it because yeah, he made some compelling points about how materials are evolving and so forth. What's the argument for this, Adam? Uh, thank you. And a great question, uh, uh, Councilman Reamer. And I'm also joined by Eileen Kao. Um, everybody knows her. Uh, she's the smart one on this stuff. So I'll defer to her um, a little bit more. Um, so we are, you know, we, you know, we, we hear the, the feedback um, um, from Ms. Myhill and we welcome if, you know, what, what um, specificity might make the council a little bit more comfortable. Um, I'll just talk about uh, our intent and, um, and I think we probably all agree on the intent and if there's a way that we put guideposts in or uh, are more prescriptive, totally open to that. Um, so we already have um, uh, a waste reduction program in theory. Um, so the first part of our proposal is just to sort of bundle it into something a little bit more formal and include um, specific um, uh, waste reduction um, um, material issues. Uh, so that gets into the straw issue, uh, which, which was raised, for example. Um, the industry is evolving all the time. There's uh, materials that, um, that we learn are just not sustainable, not recyclable at all, although it seems to be. And then there's a public demand for alternatives. You know, we're seeing that the compostable products come down in, in price. Uh, we're seeing other plastics that are more valuable um, uh, come up as alternatives. So we wanted to be able to be more nimble and um, this is already kind of the stuff that we do. We're expected to respond, you know, just like these two bills here today. So, you know, why not put it, um, you know, in, in, on a different track um, where, you know, when we're able to show that there are um, environmentally sustainable and affordable alternatives um, that we can just do it through regulation. Still has a public process, but we do a public hearing. It goes to, to you all, you can call a public hearing. If you, want, if you don't like what we wrote, you can send it back and we can fix it. Um, but we, we, um, we just thought that this was a more efficient way uh, to continue to advance you know, our goals of uh, reducing uh, you know, waste and protecting the environment. Um, Eileen, um, anything you would add to, to what I said? I would just add, you know, we, we really patterned this after the same type of um, enabling law regarding recycling that exists in chapter 48 today. So we really just wanted to expand that to also recognize the fact that um, we do have our waste reduction initiatives as well. Wanted to be able to, uh, to get into more detailed requirements pertaining to waste reduction, um, as, as Adam and Amanda talked about the different materials, but also in addition, just trying to reduce the creation of waste to begin with. Um, looking at reuse opportunities, looking at repair opportunities to extend the useful life of items so that they're not disposed as, you know, as early as they may otherwise be, those types of initiatives as well. Um, so we would be, you know, we would be happy to, to work together to, if there's more specificity um, more guidance language that uh, that the council would like to see. I'm I'm very interested to know like what's next. I mean, you just alluded to some of them. Some of those are big policy issues that I'm sure I would agree with you on. Like, it sounded like you were sort of alluding to right to repair and and things like that. Uh, I, I don't know. What, you know, there's a lot there. But what 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 is next in the more you know immediate term? Because the examples that we've been given, you know, it's really one type of plastic um, that we could easily just ban. Uh, we don't necessarily need to um, kind of provide a, a broader scope of authority to, to deal with that. So why do you need, why do you need this? Well, I'll, I'll give a, a quick answer and then uh, Eileen, who has more experience with uh, Montgomery County's regulatory process, um, please, please chime in. Um, just efficiency. Um, this seems to be not, so. An example is plastic bags. Plastic bags are sort of next in the queue of, of what seems to be something that we're going to um, ban sooner or later. Um, in the state of Maryland, there's a bill at the state of Maryland um, level, but there's um, but there's also interest in doing it here if that if that doesn't um, if that doesn't have legs in Annapolis. So um, 
So by opening up the, 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 the statute every time that, you know, there's a new product innovation um, or that, you know, there's a consensus among restaurants um, or that the costs have come down, um, doesn't seem, didn't in, in our view, seem to be the right fit. It seemed to be that this is something you expect us to do over time. Um, and this was just a way to formalize it. With the regulation, then we're just focusing on the item, on like the plastic type of item, um, and then uh, and then having a schedule for um, for proposing alternatives. Eileen, what would you add? Um, again, we we really proposed this so that we could accomplish the same types of things, but do it in a, a little bit more hopefully streamlined way. Instead of going back and changing Chapter Forty Eight of the County Code each time, um, but to be able to propose and and. You know, when we propose by method one regulation, we actually have to publish in the county register that we are proposing a regulation. We have to provide folks the um, a summary of the regulation and then a contact name and phone number or email address in order to get the full regulation. We have to have a public comment period published in the register we have customarily always held public hearings and we uh, publish the date and the time of the public hearing. We allow people to uh, provide their written, I mean, their, I'm sorry, their verbal testimony, as well as provide written testimony. We actually have to go through each and every one of the comments and um, catalog the comments, then also distill the comment um, looking at the proposal and then uh, oftentimes we will then be amending if you know if it's appropriate the language when we transmit the proposed regulation to the council all of these things are transmitted to council the um, the proposed regulation the comments that were raised in a public hearing the comments that were received that were in writing and sort of the distillation of them. And that's to begin the process that the council takes up their executive regulation. And, and through method um, one. I'm sorry, go ahead, Eileen, I just had a thought. But um, and then through method one, of course, the council may take an action to either um, approve the regulation or disapprove it. But in the context of the process, Historically, we've always been able to work together and work through issues to, um, you know, whatever, again, issues are raised. And if my memory holds correctly, I think that the council can also, if they wish, hold public work sessions, public um, discussions of the proposed regulation. And again, you know, hear comments, hear input, feedback. So from our perspective, it's a process where we felt provides more input um, opportunities, not less. But we were hoping that it would be more streamlined of a process rather than going back every time to the, the county code to amend. So to follow up, I mean, I strongly favor banning plastic bags. I, I regret, frankly, that we have the policy that we have. I think if, if we, if we could start over, I, I think we would just ban plastic bags and then leave it at that. Um, and I think we painted ourselves into a bit of a corner uh, as far as the fact that businesses are able to, you know, revenue source. Yeah, they get a, they get a little bit of revenue from this existing framework. Um, but I also wonder really whether it's viable to say that plastic bags could be banned by regulation. I think that would I hear what you're saying about there's a lot of opportunity for input, um, but that's a little bit of a, dis you know, that's, that is a big distinction from a legislative process where the public, you know, where people can try to stop it if they want to by lobbying their council members, you know, five of whom represent them wherever they live in Montgomery County, right, Evan? Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, that would, I wonder if that's really viable to, to, have that kind of authority in, in the regulatory body. It just, uh, I would, I would like to get rid of plastic bags as quickly as possible. I wonder if we would sustainably be able to, you know, 
have a policy that doesn't allow for as much legislative input on that. But interested what my colleagues think. Mr. Glass. Uh, I, I appreciate the line of questioning and um, Ms. Cow explaining the rationale behind this. And it seems like we're trying to reduce the regulatory bureaucratic nature of creating new regulations. Is that correct? Uh, I think it is correct that we're trying to reduce the sort of um, bureaucratic hurdles. The, the, we're trying to streamline and make it as, as least bureaucratic as we can. Yeah. Okay. And so, so what I'm wrestling with, quite frankly, is if it, it sounds like if a regulation, if, if the executive, a future executive, current executive were to create a, a regulation wanting to uh, ban or curtail the use of, of some type of environmentally hazardous material, uh, there would still be a council hearing, right? And we'd still go through that public conversation, but it would not it would not be required to go through the same bureaucratic rigor with notices and filings and all these other things and actually adding it to the code. Is that correct? So we are required. Uh, Mr. Glass. Um... Yeah. Yeah, Ms. Myhill, this is probably better suited for you. I apologize. Thank you. Sure. And my apologies, I lost power. And so I'm not, I didn't hear the beginning of what she said, although I did hear the question about regulation. So we live in a rural area and we're at the mercy of the wind. So <laughs> um, for executive regulations, there's a couple of important notes in terms of council authority. One is that the council um, does have approval authority if it's a method one or a method two. And I'm just going to focus on method one because that's what the proposal is. Um, so it could not take effect without the council having approved it. The council does not, does not typically hold regulation or excuse me, does not typically hold public hearings on regulations. They do, um, usually have work sessions on executive regulations, but not typically hearings. And the other, um, the other important point in terms of, um, um, authority is really, you know, the authorship of the law versus the regulation. If it's a regulation, the council cannot actually make any changes. They're executive documents, and historically, staff has always been able to work well with the executive staff um, and work out issues, and the council's been able to work out issues with the executive over regulations. But the fact remains that they are executive documents that the council doesn't really have um, any sort of editing authority over, as opposed to legislation where the council really can craft the uh, the policy as it's working through the legislation. Okay, um, I I appreciate uh, that that explanation. Uh, you you help streamline my understanding of the the bureaucratic legal maneuvering we're here, and 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 I think you succinctly honed in on what my thinking is. Uh, you know if. Uh, as, as I know, when we're talking about with the, the, the COVID and the health regulations, we can't amend that. And I know many of us at various times wish we could have tweaked it. Uh, and for those reasons, I'm hesitant to grant this new authority uh, to the executive when I think that is a legislative conversation uh, and a legislative prerogative. But clearly associate myself with the comments of the chair and Mr. Reamer in that we, we support environmental regulations and know that we can and will be going farther but I think the legislative branch, the council, should retain that legal right. So I yield back. Okay, Mr. Reamer, where'd you land on this? Can we talk a little bit more. Thanks. Can we hear a little bit more about what uh, council staff sort of alluded to? Not a middle ground, but more details in a in a in a plan. And DP alluded to more details in a plan. What what is that? What are you getting at there? What do you can we can you bring that out a little bit? Sure. So from my perspective, um, is similar to most of the laws the council enacts, if you give sufficient parameters in the law that then allows DEP some flexibility to implement the law, I really don't have any um, concerns about that. 
Um, but the way that it's currently drafted is just very broad that DEP can basically create any regulation that's associated with um, reducing waste. And so I don't have a particular proposal for you, but if that's the direction that the committee is inclined to go, then I will work with um, Mr. Ortiz and Ms. Ko to, to develop those for you. I see. So if we, you know, one option is move forward now with, there's certain materials you're asking us to take care of right now. Is that right, Director Ortiz? Um, yeah, the straw. This, uh, the, the straw piece is the, the principal um, issue in this bill, and it just so happens that it was the part of the code that addressed this regulatory piece. And then there's a separate bill that is the other uh, polystyrene products. Right. So Correct. you're asking right. us to deal with the, the immediate issues now. So from a short-term perspective, if we were to move forward with, you know, legislation that does not include the regulatory uh, delegation or, or the delegation of powers, essentially, you know, we would still be able to proceed with the materials that we know, we all know we want to deal with. Um, but at the same time, um, how, what, why, are, why is the straw ban and the regulatory delegation in the same bill? Is that right? They're in the same bill? Correct. Is there a reason why you have them together and not, and not have one that's sort of freestanding? Eileen? Again, to, to kind of streamline the process, we, um, we began work some time ago on um, the proposal regarding straws, drinking straws. And we just felt, because we also at the same time wanted to make the clarification on um, the polystyrene issue. So we recognized that in streamlining our efforts that perhaps we could propose at the same time this kind of enabling language regarding waste reductions. So the next time there's another material that comes up that we could do it in a more streamlined way instead of again, coming back, you know, through this process and to you, but you using think, the other process perhaps. Could you please name a couple of materials you think might be likely to be next? Plastic bags have been mentioned, what else? Um, we, we are looking, for example, at, um, some of the items that we find in the waste stream that, that cause, um, volatile situations and cause, um, fires, for example. So we wanted to take a closer look at those. Um, we also wanted to try. Let me just bring that up. So you mean like, um, what do you mean? Saying that you would not be able to just sell them because they're volatile or you would not be able to dispose of them or? Right, looking at, um, in, you know, trying to come out and say that they must not be disposed in the waste stream, but rather must be disposed in safer ways. Um, and, you know, thinking of sort of the flammable, um, battery issue, for example, which we have found has, has been problematic. And um, when they come into contact with other things, they can spark fires in the waste. So that's one item. Yeah, and I, and I can provide some others in, in, in a, a councilman. These aren't ready for prime time, but I'll just share some things that people are talking about that maybe um, could, could help um, answer your question a little bit, your curiosity. Um, so we're going to talk next about number six plastics. They're a, a trash plastic. Um, there are other trash plastics. Um, number sevens are trash plastic. They aren't quite as ubiquitous. That's something we haven't spent as much time looking into, but it's been alerted to us. Uh, under the um, EPS bill, my understanding is that it, uh, you can still use styrofoam for meats and uh, raw foods. Um, there's been interest in looking at that and uh, getting rid of styrofoam because there are alternatives um, that, uh, that are recyclable, um, where raw foods uh, sit on, uh, for example. And then there's an issue of mixed plastics. Um, so um, if, uh, if there's a, um, you know, like this pen, um, nobody quote, we're not gonna ban pens. I just wanna be clear about that. <laughs> this pen has like three or four different kinds of plastics in it. So therefore this, this, this plastic, this pen is not recyclable. 
Um, it might be hard to require all pens to have one type of plastic, but maybe uh, water bottles should have one type of plastic. So the cap and the container both can be recycled together. Um, these are just things we've heard. Um, these are things that we'd like to explore um, as we get, uh, as, as we proceed. And again, like Eileen said, doing it through a regulation just might be a little bit easier uh, on everybody than, um, than, than opening up the code every time that there's some, some innovation. Does that answer your question, Councilman? I think so. I mean, you know, I think my, my reaction to it is, I wonder if you would really want to send legislation over for some of those items. You might not, but you might be more likely to do a regulation. And so I'm sympathetic in the one sense that, you know, we, we might get more small things that you can actually tackle that make a difference. Um, on the other hand, I do have some concerns about big things. Right. People will feel it's just unfair, you know, not to have a chance to really have a legislative process where things have to get compromised on or worked out or whatever it is the case may be. Right. On the, the scenario you raise, as long as uh, Amanda's power's on while it's on, uh, let me ask you on the scenario uh, that uh, Councilmember Rima raised, could we ban uh, say plastic bags through executive regulation. I assume we can, but there'd be probably some reasons we wouldn't want to because the public wouldn't be as mu much of a part of the process for something that significant. Is that accurate? Or something so big we would have to go the legislative route if we were to enact this? Uh, without having done any research on it, <laughs> um, I, I don't know of anything off the top of my head that would prohibit that being done by regulation if the executive has authority to do so in law. Um, the question is, is that's a very big policy discussion that in council staff's view is more appropriate for the legislative process as opposed to the regulatory process. And if it's helpful, I just don't I have it in, in front of me. Um, just the, the guardrails, and, we, and these are the guardrails that we came up with, but we welcome other guardrails if, if that's helpful. Um, looking at page two, um, for those of you who want to read along, uh, under um, you know line 20 is uh, the actual regulations. Uh, the executive may adopt regulations. Um, the are regulations on, may. So are you on page two of the, legisla of the legislation? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, page two of the legislation. Um, so the regulations um, talk about a curtailing um, problem materials. The second one, line 26, um, the interest uh, in environmentally preferable, and then there's criteria A, B, and C. And uh, we thought that these were reasonable guardrails. These are the same standards that we're applying to what we're bringing to you today. Um, a, um, this is line 30, evaluation of the amount of the product or material present in the waste stream. An analysis B of the detrimental impacts on the environment of the product or material. And C, the establishment that alternative products or materials exist that cause less environmental impact, are affordable, are comparable in function, and capable of fulfilling the same needs as other conventional products or materials. So we thought that by those three, A, B, and C, um, that was, those were thresholds um, that we would have to, you know, make a pitch for, be clear about, and that, you know, would prevent this executive or future county executive from sort of grow, going willy-nilly um, on, on, uh, on introducing um, future bans on products. But to be, uh, I think, a little more accurate, you wouldn't have to consider those. You may consider those according to the text of the, of the bill. So I don't know if my colleagues would, or if you have an objection to actually having to, con, you know, having that be a must include um, so that the public and we were assured that you were actually asking those questions and answering them. Like line 29 instead of right. saying A would be must. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, think, you, uh, Eileen, you, uh, any reaction? I don't uh, I think must, changing that word to must would be fine because we would be going through these these um, elements in our, you know, doing our due diligence. 
Right. And that comes back to my central point. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. No, please go ahead. You'd keep the first two Mays in 21 and 23 because you may not want to adopt regulations in some very minor cases you may not need to, but if you do uh, uh, promulgate regulations, we could, as an option, say you must consider these three things as a way to have more legislative oversight over the implementation of the bill. Is that, that accurate? Right, that the basis for determining mu you know, must right. be these things. Mr. Glass, mm -hmm. sorry. No, um, I mean, I know clearly in the law words Words are important, uh, but it seems that if the whole point of, of this process is, is presented by the executive and his team to give them more authority, and we're already carrying it back with the change of the word may and must, uh, I would still rather just stick with the with, with the current system. But if, if, if these minor tweaks still achieve what they want and still achieve uh, our legislative priority or prerogative, then, then I'll go with it. Because it doesn't seem quite frankly with the change of the words that anything's changing. Can I ask, are there, um, are there uh, any jurisdictions that handle it this way that you know? I'm not aware of any. Um, as usual, I think Montgomery would be pioneering. Um, Eileen, are you familiar with um, other jurisdictions that do? I'm not. Do you know what the other jurisdictions who have banned foam or banned straws, how they set up their operation? Yeah, all the ones I can think of off the top of my head, and those are the ones that, you know, are so, uh, that, that got covered by the news. It's a legislative process. So I think like, you know, part of our thinking is that we're evolving as a society and an economy where this is just kind of becoming commonplace, that there's smarter alternatives for things, that prices are coming down because market demand is, is, is greater and greater, you know, and it's huge here in Montgomery County. There's lots of demand um, for stuff that, you know, we're like, you know, has this evolved to the point where this can just become regulatory, where this can become like, oh, does this check the box? Boom. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, that's a little bit of our perspective. It seems like it's a big thing, but, you know, you know, our, our question to, to, to you all, do you agree with us that, you know, we're at the, this level of evolution, um, uh, in, in our, uh, you know, in our, at the commodities that we buy on the shelves that, you know, there's, that there are alternatives coming up and that we want to standardize, um, the way that we, that we address them and continue to, to, to rigorously try to get as many products on the shelves that are sustainable. No, that, that makes sense. I'm sure, I bet this committee would agree with, you know, 98 out of 100 of your recommendations to small tweaks to keep up with industry changes. I'm also hearing from my colleagues, we, we're interested in this topic and we'd probably like to be involved in it and we'd like um, to make sure the public, you know, is in, in involved, uh, certainly for significant things where we're going to hear from a lot of constituents. Um, Ms. Myhill, the end of um, your first paragraph on this, you, you recommended that additional specificity be identified in the law. Were, was there any language you developed that you'd suggest adding here to, to tighten this up so they didn't have such broad authority without coming back to us? So I don't have any specific language right now for you, but I can work with DEP and um, try to craft something and then send it to committee members for their approval before action. Yeah, if, Mr. That's, Chairman. if that's the direction that the committee is going. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we would welcome, you know, this is, um, this is kind of a new idea um, for this, for this, these types of materials. So, you know, we welcome the opportunity to continue dialogue with staff and, and with all of you on the regulatory piece. So it's something, uh, if, if you're not ready to move on it today, um, and if so, we welcome that conversation, but we would ask that we move ahead on the straw um, portion of the, of, the, of the legislation. Right, I think we could, um, yeah, probably clean this up and come back to it at one of our next um, meetings very soon. If you, if Ms. Michael, you don't mind drafting that um, specificity. Um, well, just to be okay. nice though, um, uh, I don't know that we can move forward with the straw piece right. while leaving this back. Uh, 
So we, they, right? I mean, I think we can. Right. I think even, I, I took that to mean we could discuss it and see if there's concern about that as well, and leave the specificity of the regulations on the table for a future meeting, without passing the bill. Right. I mean, we, we're right. sort of an all or nothing as to passing the bill or not. Uh, They're joined. Yes. Right. Exactly. Uh, are they joined? You know, I, I've raised objection or concern with with this section of the bill could we if, if there's another one of you who feels the same way we could just amend it out and, and right. deal with that's, the substance that's the alternative is to just drop this part of it and move forward yes. with the straw but then we would have to if we if we were interested in delegating this authority we would have to introduce new legislation is all uh so <laughs> i i think it's worth chewing on it for another you know a couple of weeks at least and thinking about it it's the first time i've really had to for you know really get serious about thinking about it so and, and and the point that i was just thinking you know as we're continuing talking and councilmember reamer th this is this is exactly where you are the, the the contemplation and the public conversation and i think that is what this process allows it allows the residents the stakeholders to know that there's legislation to share with us to testify in a in a process that we all know and accustomed to uh, and again that is separate from the substance of what any whatever any laws or regulations might actually be i think the process is important for for the public and as we're going to be talking about or maybe not depending on this particular section of the law and what we decide but you know uh, my understanding is that there there at what the straws the um the public education component of the straws uh is part of this conversation and i think as environmental policy continues to move forward, hopefully at warp speed, uh, that um, we will be able to educate people about what needs to be done here at home through these through these processes. So that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, well said. I mean, uh, could, could, we, could we maybe have DEP come back to us in a, you know, soon with, with a fuller presentation? I mean, I will say again, you know, it would be nice to get like a real presentation from DEP about this delegation. Like really, why do you need it? I mean, it's something you're seeking. Uh, we've gotten the text of the legislation, you know, but I think it'd be worth getting into the big picture a little bit more. And then, you know, meanwhile, we have the companion bill around this particular piece of uh, foam, which to, you know, anyway, we can, we can still move forward on that. Well, well, I think that's fine. And as an alternative, we could do what Councilmember Glass is suggesting, I think. Um, excise out uh, Section 4861 about the regulations, allow the waste reduction program to move forward, which nobody opposes, um, and and discuss the straws. And if there's not objection to that, pass the bill without the regulations and allow the presentation you're talking about, Councilmember Reamer, and uh, a new bill about the regulation when this is more fleshed out. Yeah, we could do that too. With Ms. Meisel's specificity. Um, how does that sound, everybody? Sounds fine. I move that, sure. Okay. Sure. So I guess that's without objection. Ms. Meisel, we're going to take out 4861. Is that fine with you, Director Ortiz? That allows you to, we should talk about the straws, but um, that would, that framework would allow the legislation to move forward without more delay. And then you can come back to us with the proposal on the regulation. That's fine. Yeah, thank you. It's a great discussion. Great. Um, should we move to 4862, the straw? Okay. Mr. Chairman, there were a handful of um, uh, suggested amendments um, for, on the straw piece. And if it's okay with you, if you'll indulge us, we wanted to chime in and respond because I, I think that they're, um, uh, I think they're, 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 uh, they're Worthy discussion. I think without objection. Go ahead. Okay. Um, and uh, these are no particular order. Um, there was feedback in our discussion. And I also want to say we've, we've had a great conversation um, with, um, uh, with the chambers and uh, with uh, the restaurant association and folks who are all over the map. And so we, we even were talking uh, late uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, so this isn't in the legislation. It seems like we have the votes to pass, but it's something I would just like to share just in the interest of you know, moving as a, with a broad consensus on some items. Um, to be more specific about an educational campaign on, um, on reducing straw usage and requiring straws upon request. 
um, for a year, um, for a year period. This way, um, it will help lessen the, uh, uh, the, the financial impact on, uh, on restaurants if they're giving out less straws. So that was a, a principal um, issue in, in our last straw campaign. That was one. Um, the second one is uh, an exemption um, uh, for self-serve straws, since people are basically choosing uh, at that point, it's not handed out, carry out, delivery, and drive through um, with the proviso that um, that um, the servers have to ask. Like, uh, you know, just like, do you want fries with that? Do you want a straw with that? So um, so we thought that that was reasonable that um, came from Cava. I know um, Councilman Glass's favorite restaurant. Um, and it also came from the Restaurant Association. Um, watch the harissa sauce. If you get too much, that is like really, really. But that is, kind of balances it out. I'm just saying. The whole point. That harissa, I mean, that is from heaven. That stuff is amazing. Yeah. With you. Oh, yeah. Second. Oh, good. So good. But uh, you're playing with fire there, ladies and gentlemen. For those at home, small children, just be careful. What about the sugar? <laughs> um, uh, this was brought up. I, I'm not exactly sure how to handle it. Um, uh, actually, Dan uh, Simons mentioned it. Um, bubble tea. Um, bubble tea. Uh, I, we're not sure if there's paper alternatives for bubble tea. Um, the oversized straws? Yeah. There actually are paper um, oversized straws that bubble tea could be accommodated with. Okay, I'll scratch that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally is the issue on PLA. So um, so Dan uh, mentioned it a few minutes ago. Um, uh, DEP and the administration share this concern. So um, uh, these straws, they're, they're, they're not made from fossil fuels, but if they don't end up in an industrial composting environment, um, and, and, and there's, you know, there's, I could talk about how available those are. This will remain in the environment just as long as this fossil based straw is. So it is not compostable in the environment. Like if you buried it in the woods, it would still be there in 10 years. If it floats out into the ocean, um, it'll still be in the ocean in, in 10 years. Petroleum is less the issue than the litter, in my opinion. I mean, they're both bad, but the litter exactly. is. Exactly. Um, I, I, but I want to go back to the bubble tea. I know there may be over straw size straw uh, paper straws, but do they work for bubble tea? I mean, I think of them having friction on the way through the straw and creating a paper taste. Is that not the case? Have you have you been able to try that? We have any experience there? I'd hate to. I'd hate to. I, I actually was curious and. Um, we've been working to get some straw samples and so I actually had gotten a thing of bubble tea and I did um, I did use the paper oversized paper one it if when you're drinking it it seems to function um, I know in Adams in my discussions with a lot of uh, the stakeholders and different restaurants you know they they've just always said that they need to make sure too that the functionality is there so I am not sure um, I think you know, some of that is in the eyes of the beholder. But to me, it, it functioned. I was able to drink the bubble tea with the oversized paper straw. And did the restaurants agree or did they, you know, spectrum here of one to it was the worst thing ever to 10, it was fine. Where were they? You know, in our conversations with the restaurant, you know, owners and managers, uh, you know, it, it does vary. I mean, I think that, again, um, they just kept sharing with us that they want to make sure that the functionality is also maintained. So we didn't get any specific yeses or nos in the discussions, but um, but they just want to make sure that yes, even if there are environmentally friendlier or preferable alternatives, they just want to make sure that the overall function is always maintained. And and we have talked to a number of restaurants where the paper-based ones, paper-based straws. They feel very much so maintain functionality while being environmentally preferable. And the proposal from us includes bubble tea, does not does not exempt bubble tea straws. I mean, there's no distinction made, so they would be subject to this. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Raymer. Yeah. 
you could craft language. I don't know if you want to single out bubble tea, but you could craft language, um, and it's throughout several of these types of environmental initiatives that the executive can um, de that the executive can determine that there's no um, usable environmentally friendly alternative, and then waive it for certain um, businesses like that. Yeah. I think that would be wise, you know. I mean, I, I, I can't draw a conclusion as to whether they would work for bubble tea or not. It just, it caught my attention, you know. It just seemed like something where the straw is a bigger part of that than, you know, your average, you know, big gulp. So, you know, functionality is particularly important with bubble tea or else you'd be pulling those little marbles out one at a time, I guess, with the spoon. I don't know. Yeah. We have no objection to that, but it re might require uh, councilmen some more field testing. Yes, yeah. yes, committee field trip. Make sure we do that. And my, I've got, I've got a nine-year-old to answer to who has newly discovered bubble tea. Okay, so right now they're out of the bill, right? Oh, well, we would craft language that the executive can yeah. um, exempt certain businesses and I'll have that language for you. May I ask uh, Mr. Ortiz a question? Please. Um, so related to PLA, are you now recommending that that be amended out from the bill or retain it in the bill? Well, I know that there was um, there was requests from the Sierra Club and others. Um, Correct. To, to mm -hmm. um, yeah, to, 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 to ban PLA. Yeah, the the sentence now says reusable or compost, compostable straws include straws made of paper, PLA, bamboo, silicone, or stainless steel. So I just wasn't clear if the recommendation is now to remove um, PLA so that they, the effect of that being that they could not be used. Um, we wanted to weigh in that from an environmental perspective, it's still a, a litter item. Um, and this is, you know, we've gotten a lot of education just in the last two weeks on PLA. So. So yes, it's it's in the legislation now, but I think you know, as the head of the environment, I wouldn't really be doing a service if I didn't express my concern at this point in time that um, that. Sorry it, to put it, you on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Amanda. No, it's fine. So I'm here to do. It would not be allowed. But back to the bubble tea, it's it is covered by this, but DEP would have the authority to exempt, but certainly miss. Ms. Kao has said that she thinks it's functional. So I think the assumption would be we would be affecting that product unless, you know, we hear otherwise. So I think we would need, you know, to me, it feels like as proposed, it's heading towards, it affects bubble tea uh, straws, which we're putting a lot of faith here. I, I mean, I haven't heard from restaurants myself, but we're on this specific one, but we're, right putting a lot of faith here in, you know, Ms. Kao's determination that it's, that it works, um, which I might be okay doing, I guess, but, uh, you know, I don't, know. it'd be nice to hear from. Yeah, we don't have a lot of industry input onto this, on this one. Um, and despite the fact that it also has the delayed implementation date for this section. Um, Council Member Glass, how do you feel? Well, how do I feel about what? I'm not sure what that bubble tea, the bubble tea remaining in or coming out. Uh, I, 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 I support what was just discussed. I think car, putting it aside um, or allowing the executive to put it aside after consultation with, with industry makes sense. So minimally, we'll have language in there that allows the executive branch to make a determination um, on you know specific products, which I think is already there in in some ways, but let's belt suspenders there, and then we can follow up and 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 you know there should be a regulatory process for this specific pro product. I think is would that be required? Well, uh, uh, Councilman, uh, there's uh, there's definitely places in all of, all over the law where people can request a waiver of the department on different things. So I would suggest that it's that process. It could be something as simple as the website. If you want to request a waiver because of functionality, um, please email us and okay. email. Provider. That exists, and yeah. then you'll you'll put that you'll make that publicly aware. I mean, I really don't have a strong opinion here. I'm just I'm 
it's just something that caught my attention. That's all. I want to make sure we get it right. That's fair. Okay. Okay. So everybody's clear? Ms. my help. You're good. Uh, I am. There is one additional issue that I raised in my packet. And now that we're electronic, let me scroll up for a minute, please. Um, and that is um, if you look on the circle or on the middle of page four, there is some um, language related to um, federal disability rights laws and where uh, customers, if they have a need, um, a disability related need, they could get straws. Yeah. This is just a tightening of the language. We heard concerns from uh, restaurants and a disability organization. Um, and so I would suggest that language to you. Agreed. I, I absolutely agree. Yep. To your last grade, without objection. Um, and if if you want me to, I could walk through all of the changes, or I, I defer to how because that's the last issue that we have on this particular bill, unless someone else has an additional issue. So I'm happy to walk through what I understand the changes to be um, at the appropriate time. Thank you. Um, can I just raise number seven in your packet? Um, I'm. Um, appreciate the letter that was sent in from the chambers and the restaurant association. Um, uh, and I know how effective the educational campaigns that DEP has been able to put together on uh, recycling and solid waste um, and composting and pesticides have been. I hear good feedback about them quite a bit. I appreciate the mailings that I get and the flyers I see in stores and things like that and the, and the bus ads. And uh, Personally, I think it's a great idea um, if we can uh, find it in your budget to have an educational campaign because it certainly will save us money on enforcement later and um, keep keep the public happier. We'd be happy to do that, um, and, and we would um, suggest that with the an interest in source reduction that uh, we, we we make a strong push um, for the on request that straws provided on request. But yeah, we're happy to do that. We'd love to do the education. And certainly suggest that they uh, they offer the online our last straw campaign as a model, which sort of writes itself. We could just bring a lot of that to Montgomery County. Great. Yeah, I'll also say that uh, that, uh, that the members of that coalition have um, have volunteered to be resources for any businesses that are finding this difficult or confused. So we have a series of coaches in the industry that are uh, on call to help. I was going to suggest maybe you could uh, involve. Um, or feature some of our uh, uh, well-respected uh, local Montgomery County businesses that are in favor of this legislation and have already adopted this voluntarily in your uh, educational materials. Absolutely. Will do. Okay. So anything else on this bill? You Do you want to summarize, Ms. Myhill? Thank you. Sure. There is one other. Um, I just wanted to get the committee's feedback. We heard from DEP. Um, also, but I just wanted to confirm it with the committee that the Chambers of Commerce and the Restaurant Association wanted an amendment to exempt self-service straw dispensers and carry out delivery of drive through And as uh, Mr. Ortiz noticed, noted, DEP is fine with that as long as there's an, um, it's clear that the restaurant has to still ask the question. Um, council staff is comfortable with that uh, amendment incorporated into the bill. I just wanted to hear from the committee specifically on that. by me anybody else yeah I think without objection yes great okay so then to summarize your recommendation um would, and i still need to vote for that but your recommendation would be to um to enact bill 3220 with the following amendments to remove the regulation language um and make it i'll make it clear in the packet um for council that this is that issue is coming back to committee it's not off the table, it's just coming back to committee. And the other amendments would be to require an educational campaign, um, the exemptions related to self-service straws and carry out and delivery and drive through as we just spoke about, amending out um, allowable straws uh, made of PLA, and then adding language in um, to allow the executive after consultation with the industry to um, waive the straw requirement um, if there's no acceptable alternative. 
and the education campaign, if you want to write that in. Yes. Yeah, and um, and Ms. Myhill, did, did, did you feel that the existing language um, was strong enough on the um, straws only on request? Yes. Okay. Yes, I thought that, and excuse me, there was one other one related to uh, the disability language on page four, so my apologies for that. Thank you, yes. And I will, um, uh, I will incorporate all of these changes and of course send it to the committee before it goes to council action as well as uh, the department. Okay. So we need a motion to approve as this guy is summarized by our capable council. So moved as amended. Okay. So, so uh, uh, without objection, I guess. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. We, we have a, a new committee recommendation. Okay. Ms. Michael, we have another bill in front of us. Yes, sir, you do. And you summarized it well before, but since uh, that was a while ago, I will uh, just summarize it for you again. And that is that uh, Bill 3320 would prohibit the use of polystyrene food service products, um, require the use of compostable or recyclable food service ware, uh, prohibit the sale of polystyrene food service products and polystyrene loose fill packaging, um, and then make some other general changes. Um, I summarized the public hearing testimony and correspondence and attached them to the packet. I will note that there is an addendum that I also circulated. Essentially, the council heard from uh, the American Chemistry Council um, that they preferred or they urged you not to adopt this bill, but instead work on uh, recycling, increasing recycling capacity and the department's response to that, which I'm sure they can share with you on this uh, call as well, um, was in the addendum packet. Um, and so there was this issue um, that just came in related to um, egg cartons. Um, I don't know if uh, the department has a view on that. My initial staff recommendation was to enact the bill as it was introduced, but um, but I hadn't yet seen that amendment. Okay. Ms. Ortiz, can you, the way I understood uh, this, um, and I, I think it's coming from a group that wasn't familiar with our process, was that um, obviously, Interstate commerce, we're not allowed to regulate. Intrastate commerce can be regulated by the state. The recent state bill that Senator Kagan and Delegate Learman um, sponsored uh, included this exemption for eggs in line 51, where 50 and 51, where there's the exemption for the packaging for raw, uncooked, or butchered meat, fish, poultry, or seafood. Eggs would be included in that. The argument was um, that it would, because, um, well, the question, that I guess, is uh, to summarize, do we want to put the county, this county law in the same posture as the state law that just became put into effect? And if not, uh, that it puts Maryland egg producers at a competitive disadvantage to out-of-state producers because they'd be able to sell into Montgomery County, um, whereas Maryland producers would not be. Um, actually, I defer to Eileen, who's um, who has a lot more background on this issue in particular. Thanks, Eileen. Sure. So, um, so actually, you know, this this bill is is really a clarification um, regarding number six plastics, and so truthfully, the the eggs the eggs issue um, we had looked at when uh, Mr. Reamer when we were working on forty one fourteen. And so there, there are a lot of alternatives for eggs to be placed in. There's the fiberboard, paperboard alternatives. There's the, um, the number one pet thermoform plastics. Um, you know, we, we actually had decided only to exempt the, um, the meat trays that raw and butchered meat poultry and seafood come on because of the fact the characteristics of those raw meats and um, 
and seafood, you know, putting off the blood and the liquids, really at that time we felt that there was really no functional alternative that could um, sustain the liquids and the, the blood from those items. Uh, we really feel that it's different with the eggs because the nature of eggs, if, if the eggs are intact, there's really no liquid per se. Um, and if by chance one or another gets broken, still the paperboard and the pet thermoform contain egg cartons, you know, still function, carry out the functions just as well. Um, so from our perspective, uh, the, the eggs sold in Montgomery County have already been subject to uh, not being in expanded polystyrene, i.e. styrofoam packaging. Um, already. You know, unless they were, unless they were um, shipped in from, shipped in from, you know, from outside the county in, in those containers. Uh, there are no rigid number six polystyrene egg containers or egg cartons. Part of that we believe is because of the um, sort of the rigidity of that number six plastic. So it wouldn't be able to withstand the weight of the eggs as easily. There are clear plastic egg containers I see now. It's yeah. not polystyrene. It's not, they're number one pet thermoforms, which have more give to them. In other words, if you if you push on the number one pet thermoform plastics, they will they have some give to them, and they will actually kind of bounce back and take their form or shape again. Um, not so with number six rigids. Is it so? I hate to say it, but I think this is purely, is it just about cost? Like, you know, the egg producers that want to use styrofoam it's or polystyrene, it's just cheaper for them? Is that really what it is, what it comes down to? Um, it, it could be. It could be. We've priced out egg cartons, and, you know, there are, um, there are comparably priced egg cartons that are made out of paper fiberboard. There are comparably priced ones made from the number one pet thermoforms, which are recyclable in Montgomery County. And when we say they can't use expanded polystyrene, but they have to use instead recyclable or compostables instead, our definition of recyclable has always been recyclable here in Montgomery County's recycling program. Um, and so same thing with the rigid number sixes. We've we found, we've done a lot of research. We continue to put a lot of research on our website about the uh, preferable alternatives and the pricing. So, you know, someone might say that uh, it's a pricing issue, but we know from our research that there definitely are preferable alternatives comparably priced. Um, we just, we can't say exactly how much someone is paying currently for the option that they have chosen, but we know that there are comparable um, priced items. Can I ask two questions? I, I didn't, I'm glad to know, um, Ms. Kerr, that you had looked into this. Um, do we, I probably should know this, but do we have egg producers in Montgomery County? Are we disadvantaging them or are we just disadvantaging Maryland companies that are outside Montgomery County? My understanding, there are some egg producers that are located in the county. There are not many egg producers located in the county, and they're not um, they're not the mega egg producer, you know. Small family egg, farms or whatever, but okay, they're, they're already living with the 2014 law. Presumably. The 4114 law. Right. Yeah, the 20, yeah, so I'm sorry, 20. With it. This would be a change. Um, well, this would not be a change, I guess, for any Maryland companies that are outside Montgomery County. Any, so I guess a related question would be, do you know of, have you heard from or talked to any um, companies that are, um, that have, have made the switch to access the Montgomery County market or is our egg market large enough that companies have made the switch so they could sell in non-polystyrene containers here? Um, we had talked with a couple of smaller egg producers that are located in the county when the initial uh, 
styrofoam ban went into effect and we explained the requirements to them. We've not heard anything else from them. So we think that they have successfully made the, the changes. And I've not heard specifically since then about any egg issues for any egg producers in the county. But so it's accurate to say then that any Maryland egg producers outside Montgomery County would already be complying with their 2014 law, is your understanding? They wouldn't have to change anything because of what we might do today. Um, okay, so from the 2014 law, it was any eggs that came from outside the county. Mm -hmm. To be sold so, in Montgomery County could not be in styrofoam. Anything from inside the county could not be in styrofoam. And right. what about anything from outside the county? If they had been packaged prior to coming into the county. Oh, they could. In right. styrofoam, yeah. Because that's right, in inter-county. Okay. Right, we, can't, we couldn't affect that. Right, that okay. makes sense. Okay, colleagues? Just so, just to be clear, we're not we're not accepting the request. That would be a step backward, as far as I could tell. Um, so, right? That's what we just discussed. Yeah. Okay. Director, this would be a step backwards. Mr. Hucker, may I make one yes. clarification? Uh -huh. Yes, please. Which is, um, assuming you're okay with the uh, bill as introduced substantially, there are there were a few technical amendments that were needed to the bill. So your recommendation would be um, enact with amendments, but um, they're really related to the description on the long title of the bill. But I just wanted to make that crystal clear. Right, thank you. We, yeah, we, we won't move on until, but so um, is, are we without objection on, uh, we're rejecting the, you uh, Mr. Glass. So I, I just have a quick question. We're talking about the cost, right? And trying to figure out the, the producer's cost or, the consumer's cost, uh, but in, in the extensive conversations I've had with Director Ortiz over the last two years or so, I, I know uh, with some of these items that are not environmentally friendly, uh, there are county costs with regard to our uh, waste management system. Uh, does, this have, does this particular item have any effect on, on our costs and process? And Mr. Glass, thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so number, um, number six polystyrene is uh, not recyclable uh, in our system or virtually any system, or at least not uh, in any way that's um, affordable. Um, so, uh, and there are lots of alternatives that are recyclable. And uh, what happens is that um, people think that these number sixes are recyclable, so they put them in the recycling bin so we double process um, them. So the, you know, for example, I have a lot of props here. I won't bore you to tears. So this is a number six, this is a number one. This number six costs us about $130 a ton to process. Um, approaching um, you know, this and other plastics more than $500,000 a year on these, these no good plastics. This one makes us um, more than $200 a ton. So, um, so people talk about the recycling markets being upside down. Um, it's definitely a tough time, but part of the problem um, for sure is that there's a lot of these trash plastics. Um, so uh, it has all the same problems that styrofoam had. Um, you know, this is polystyrene. You'll recall that the styrofoam ban or styrofoam ban foam ban uh, was expanded polystyrene. So it's um, the same type of resin, same material. It's just more rigid. Um, so yes, this is a uh, same problems with styrofoam, not recyclable, costly to the county, and by getting alternatives that are worth something, uh, we're helping get in the black. Well, I, I, I appreciate that, and I, I recall seeing in some correspondence that I or we received regarding today's broader conversation. In certain instances, uh, people were were suggesting that we improve our a recycling program to accommodate some of these items rather than uh, banning them or dis disencouraging them. And, and what you're telling me is we, we can't do that because either the, the science isn't there or we don't have the capacity or capability to do so. Yeah, well, I'm going to try not to go on a lengthy diatribe here, uh, Councilman Glass, but but yeah, this um, we've been hearing this for years and I was involved in the statewide phone ban 
testifying in Annapolis and when I was in Prince George's, I know we passed at the same time that Montgomery did, or at least with the same effective date. Um, this is a this is this is fake news. Um, the um, first of all, even if we had the machinery um, that you know they're willing to grant us, uh, this material is still worthless in the recycling market. So we're still not making any money. But actually, what they're proposing, and uh, the uh, lobbyists from the Chemistry um, uh, Council um, basically was implying that we should waste even more money on trying to process number six plastics. So if they give us this machine that's able to process it better, uh, we still have to staff it. So we still have to find space for it. And then we still have to transport even more of this stuff. So, um, so it's throwing um, more good money after that. So it's just not in any kind of uh, sensible, um, uh, financially responsible framework to, to try to recycle this material. Okay, ending diatribe, but you get the idea. Uh, no, uh, having, having heard you uh, passionately speak about this issue with your show and tell that I, I do appreciate every time I see it, um, uh, I, I thank you for, for, for that. Uh, so I, I have no other questions and I'm, I'm comfortable with what I think uh, was agreed upon uh, prior to my conversation. Great, can, can I uh, indulge me with two uh, remaining questions? Um, since I've learned a lot from this, um, uh, Ms. Kale, you said uh, in the 2014 law, uh, you needed to leave in this exemption for meat and fish trays uh, for raw, those raw um, proteins because there wasn't an exception on the market and uh, to styrofoam. Um, to Councilmember Reamer's earlier comments, those are exactly what my constituents were waving around, all of our constituents were waving around in, in parades in Tacoma Park 10 years ago. Um, and they're really not covered by this bill or by the 2014 bill. It wasn't clamshells they were waving around, which McDonald's banned decades ago, I think. Um, it was the trays. And so is it still true that there's no alternative to styrofoam trays? I mean, there are so many hard plastics on the market that would be uh, liquid proof um, for blood or, uh, or what, condensation. Are there no plastic trays in this space? There's a, we're all stuck with the foam ones? Yeah, in, in terms of the trays, uh, I have not seen trays, plastic or other material type trays that have been used for the raw, you know, raw um, meats, raw seafood, raw um, poultry. I, I have, we have started seeing there are these um, deeper containers, plastic containers in which the prepackaged, they're like um, ground turkey, ground chicken, and they come to the store in that container with a plastic film vacuum packed on the top of it. Um, you'll see those in meat in meat sections or meat cases in the grocery stores. Yeah. But I've not seen trays, um, and especially because those kind of butchered meats are um, they're usually prepared and packaged or further cut and then packaged right. in the store. Mm -hmm. I have not yet seen. Right, because you're right, there are hard plastic clamshells at, you know, Whole Foods in many places for like ground meat or tur meat, turkey, whatever, right? But you're right, not, I haven't, I can't remember seeing trays. Hans? You... Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add, like in the case of eggs, it seems like there's, there is a pretty clear alternative. In the case of these meats that get wet or seafood, it's bacteria issues and it's not a litter issue. You know, at the end of the day, I don't think a lot of hamburger patty trays are ending up in the creeks, you know. It's so uh, I think given that there isn't a great alternative and there isn't really a big litter problem with these, it makes sense to continue this allowance. Although I I'm sure many of us in the stores, when we pull that product off the shelf, it, it always sort of makes you ask like, are these allowed? But it's because it's a health reason fundamentally, as I recall, it's, you know, a risk of deterioration of the product, leakage, contamination, and, and at the same time, a recognition that, uh, you know, these aren't as likely to end up in the, in the streams and all the gutters. Okay. Anyway, that was just, I don't have a proposal. That was just for my edification, but yeah, something we can keep an eye on. And my, uh, especially since the decision was six years old. And my other question was, um, 
if this is it is it accurate since I wasn't here in 2014 to think of this really as an update of 4014. Yeah, actually, both of these bills are um, the, the the 2014 required everything be recyclable or compostable. Right. Um, polystyrene is just not recyclable. And I, I know I've called you, Adam, and said, hey, you know, I go to this restaurant and they're still serving me in styrofoam clamshells. And why is that still happening in Montgomery County? And this bill is the answer to that because it closes some of these loopholes given the changes in the industry. So then my follow up question is, given that this is an update of our existing law, um, why do we, why did you propose uh, it, that it would not take effect for 12 months? That's a fair question, um, Eileen. Um, typically, we've, we've given some lead time so that when the food service businesses, when the retailers have done their ordering process, and they have a stock, existing stock of supplies, that they would be able to, you know, to utilize that stock up before we start to really, um, you know, clamp down and say, no, absolutely not. Right. Um, so that was a little bit of recognition given the state of, of those businesses. Yeah, and to be fair, you know, this um, this cup that um, Councilman Glass has seen me wave around for months um, has the recycling symbol on the bottom. <laughs> so, um, which is greenwashing, but you know, well-intentioned people, well-intentioned stores and restaurants and grocers are gonna be like, oh, it's a recycling symbol. This is great, this is recyclable. So I think a lot of people understandably think they're complying with the law. And that's why this clarification um, that number six is just don't cut it um, is important. Right. And it'll give us time to beef up and reiterate that point through education to make sure that everyone is aware, conscious of this and makes that transition changeover in in your view no I, i'm familiar with the principle in your view you're talking when you talk to retailers many of them have more than three months or six months of inventory on hand is that true um typically yes okay if they buy a lot of this in bulk okay great okay miss my do you need to summarize before we vote uh, no, the summary is just that uh, your recommendation would be enact with amendments. The only amendments are the technical ones uh, I mentioned. Okay. Are we good without objection? Okay. Lovely. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you both. Um, great to see you. We made progress today, and we're moving on to Mr. Levchenko, I think. Thank you so much, Amanda. I don't know if you're sticking around, but he's been waiting patiently to tell us about our MS4 permit. Hi, Frank. Hi, Amy. Good afternoon. All right, five years in the making, probably longer. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Okay, um, Mr. Levchenko, you want to take it away? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, mm-hmm. you can, okay. Um, Get, getting ready for Movember. Uh, yeah, as, as uh, Committee Chair Hucker mentioned, um, uh, we have a update on the uh, status of our next NPDES permit, and M- NPDES MS4 permit to be exact, um, and it's been a long time coming. Uh, the most recent permit uh, expired in 2015, uh, although the county is still subject to the conditions of that until the next permit takes effect. Uh, so we are under a permit. It's just an expired permit. And um, as, as noted in the packet, some of the conditions in that permit have been met. Uh, so it's obviously out of date. Um, although there are some elements that continue forever in it as well. Um, I, I do include in the packet a, a fair amount of information on the old permit just to provide some background. Uh, but the focus today is really on where the current, where the current permit or new permit process stands uh, and the, the major elements of the draft permit that has been promulgated and um, uh, how, that, how that impacts us or could impact us and some of the issues the county's been working with uh, the state on uh, to clarify some of those elements. Um, so I'm, I'm going to turn it over to DEP. They have a presentation that's ready to go. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. Uh, and then as they need to move slides, if they just let me know they, they want the next slide, I'll, I'll forward us to the next slide. 
Um, so bear with me here as I bring it up on my screen. Okay, you should see it in a second. Yes. Okay. Um, so I guess, uh, um, Mr. Ortiz or Mr. Dawson, you want to lead things off? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Levchenko. So I'll hand it um, off to the team. Um, uh, we're joined by Kate, Amy, and Frank from our Watershed Restoration Group. You know, great team, as you know. Um, but, uh, but before I hand it off, I just want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, your team, and, and Mr. Levchenko for your ongoing interest in the permit. Um, you keep checking in all the, like every two weeks, it seems, on the status, and um, we take it so seriously as well. So thanks for your interest. We're glad to have this time. And with that, I'll hand it over to Frank and the team. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, this was a great opportunity for me to wear a tie again for the first time in uh, six months. So I appreciate that. So, mm -hmm. so just a couple of things. NP. DS MS4, National Pollution Discharge Systems Municipal Separate Stormwater Sewer System Permit. So that's why we call it NPDES MS4. It's a mouthful. Uh, in MS4, this is an EPA definition, just as a reminder, is a conveyance or system of conveyance that is owned by a state, city, in our case, a county, entity that discharges to waters of the United States and is designed or used to collect or convey stormwater. So that includes our storm drains, pipes, and ditches. Um, I think you all know and are proud of the uh, stormwater management programs uh, that we've had for a long time in Montgomery County, and we've been both the national uh, and regional leader. Uh, this is our fourth permit. Um, and we have met the conditions of all of our three previous permits. Uh, the 2010 permit, we needed an extension uh, through a consent decree, but we did meet those requirements in December of 2018. Uh, stormwater management is a very ex expensive BMP for reducing nutrients and sediments. And the county was the first to recognize the need uh, created a funding mechanism to treat stormwater, the water quality protection charge. Uh, the charge in FY21 will be $107.06, which is a 3.6% increase from FY20. Uh, the county did meet the requirements to restore 20% of untreated impervious surface uh, this was a landmark accomplishment. Uh, we were the first to achieve that, and we were the first to commit to that. Uh, first, the county, is first in the state or first in the nation? You know, I don't know the answer to that. It was definitely the first uh, in the state, and it is a high percentage, so I, we can check on that. Uh, and the county has continued designing and constructing projects uh, since we met the permit requirements in December of 2018. And we will be counting all those projects towards our new permit restoration goal. Next. Got it. Okay. So here's just a, uh, uh, a quick, a quick uh, outline of kind of the negotiations and discussions uh, we've been having uh, with MDE, which started in a more formal sense uh, for us in August, but we have been commenting to them on drafts of the permit uh, and the accounting guidance, uh, which basically determines how much credit for, which you get for each type of BMP. Um, so in any case, uh, we met with them in September. Uh, we discussed many uh, of our concerns. Uh, we still have quite a few remaining concerning the accounting guidance. Um, 
MDE submitted what, which, what I assume is a final draft to EPA in September 29th. Uh, we received it on October 2nd. Uh, we're in the process of trying to schedule one more discussion with them before the tentative determination, uh, which is uh, set for the 23rd of October uh, with the final uh, to be issued in January or February. Uh, the tentative determination is set based on when the Merrill Register publishes, and that's every two weeks. So if for some reason they miss this, uh, it won't come out until early uh, November. They have a 90-day public comment period. So they will be moving quickly from uh, the end of the comment period uh, to final determination. Um, the, the next permit, um, it is really important uh, to note that the permit is issued to the county. Uh, I think that uh, most everyone views this as being DEP's permit, and we certainly have a huge responsibility uh, with the compliance and the reporting requirements uh, in meeting the restoration goal. Uh, but there are a lot of agencies that are involved and are critical to the implementation uh, DGS, DPS, DOT, uh, and county public schools. Uh, the permit objectives are to prohibit pollutants in stormwater discharges, and uh, they ultimately end up giving us a diet, uh, per se, TMDL, for each of those pollutants. Uh, we're going to be required to increase the treatment of untreated impervious surface. Uh, the previous permit goal was 20%. Uh, this goal uh, looks like it's going to end up being uh, 10%. Uh, we have to meet these pollution diets, not just for, we not just meet the impervious surface goal, but we also are ultimately going to have to meet reductions in sediments, nutrients, bacteria, trash, and PCBs. And there are other provisions and requirements um, in the permit. So, all right, so the main permit elements uh, and the lead agencies, just to show the partnership, uh, stormwater management, uh, DEP is in charge of inspection and maintenance uh, and implementation of restoration projects. DPS runs the permitting program, not only for stormwater management, but for erosion and sediment control. Uh, we have a monitoring and compliance program for illicit discharge detection and elimination. Uh, there's property management and maintenance requirements for many of our agencies, public education, uh, DEP. Uh, we have to develop um, total maximum daily loads for stormwater implementation plan. I've been referring to that as a diet, it's kind of a plan, how to get to an endpoint. We also have to assess the controls and provide the program funding. And as we already discussed, that's through the water quality uh, protection charge. The, uh, some of the new requirements uh, include increased record keeping. This will primarily fall on uh, DPS. We have geo database requirements for stormwater management plan review and approval. Same for erosion and sediment control inspections and violations. Next. Um, there are property management and maintenance requirements. Um, I always view uh, this type of activity is that the county needs to lead by example. So we have to develop good housekeeping plans for county properties uh, that do not have industrial discharge permits. So this is uh, managing fertilizers, pesticides. Uh, that we also have to have plans not only for these properties, but countywide for salt management, uh, which I know you all followed our uh, education campaign last year on that issue, and we'll be doing that again uh, as winter comes on. And kind of a follow-up to the earlier discussion, uh, there's requirements for litter reduction, and we're looking at expanding that program. 
next. Okay. So the county uh, is required to restore 1,814 impervious acres. To give you some context, a rough number, the county has about 35,000 acres of impervious surface. Um, this is a little bit um, higher than uh, what we had submitted to MDE, but I think we're comfortable uh, with this restoration goal uh, of the untreated uh, impervious surface in the county, it's about 9.6%. Uh, we also had to submit uh, a set of projects for our first year. And if you take the time to look at the permit, that's part of Appendix B. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. The nutrient training options are included in the permit. Um, we have not exercised that option uh, to this point, and I don't think we envision being in that position. Uh, some of the other counties have. Uh, the environmental community is generally opposed to nutrient trading. Uh, we have annual benchmarks, which are new. Uh, we have to meet 30%, 45%, 60 75 and 100 over the five-year term of the permit. Our implementation plan for year one uh, will get us to beyond 50% because of the great work uh, that we've done uh, in the interim since the last permit. So we have a running start, which is certainly different than the last permit. And as you would expect, we have annual reporting requirements. I make that sound like that's an easy task, but I know that Kate and Amy and a lot of other folks have to spend a lot of time to pull all that information together. Uh, next. Uh, we're also gonna be required to update our countywide uh, TMDL implementation plan. That will include updating uh, plans for individual pollutants such as trash, bacteria, PCBs, nutrients, and sediment. Trash focuses on the Anacostia TMDL. Uh, last year we implemented uh, over in the process of placing a trash trap in the Anacostia. Uh, for bacteria, there's going to be new bacteria monitoring requirements, and we have our pet waste program Nutrients and sediments will be addressed through our treatment of impervious surface. And we're going to have a PCB tracking program to try to identify where that pollutant is coming from in the county. And we're hoping that MDE will be helping us uh, with that. Uh, as always, we're going to, we are required to have a uh, robust outreach. Uh, to the public and other stakeholders, I think we're required to have 130 events uh, in the permit, and we believe we can meet that. Next. Uh, and lastly is uh, monitoring or assessment of controls. Uh, we're gonna be continuing uh, to uh, do our PMP effectiveness monitoring in the Brewood uh, watershed uh, we've done a whole laundry list of uh, BMPs that have been implemented there. Uh, under a watershed assessment, uh, we're going to have to change our biological and habitat assessments from um, an annual program where we rotated sites around the county to just a uh, randomly selected sites countywide. And we're going to have new monitoring programs for bacteria and chloride, and we've already secured the funding uh, for that. Last. All right, so the public comment period tentatively is going to start on October 23rd, a 90 day public comment period. Uh, there's going to be a public hearing on November the 16th, which is a Monday. Uh, we do not have a location set yet. And um, sometime between now and when the permit uh, is going to be issued, we'd like to come back and give you an update 
and talk to you about our proposed contracting approach uh, for um, completing the uh, remaining restoration of work. And I think I will stop there. The only other thing is that the public comment period also provides an opportunity for council to provide comment. So I'll stop there. I hope that wasn't too fast, uh, but that's a short capsule of where things are. And Kate and Amy, do you all have anything to add? No, not, not right now. Thank you. Wow. The only thing I would add is that the November 16th hearing is an online hearing. MDE also wants to hold one in person, and we don't have a date or location for that yet. Okay. Thank you. And the, sure. and the 23rd is assuming they make it into the register online. Right. It could change. Thanks. just wanted to, to add a couple things before we have sort of the general discussion. Um, and as you heard, um, based on the restoration requirement, uh, what Mr. Dawson was saying is that it sounds like our our CIP is relatively close to being aligned with this permit. There may be some wrinkles in it, especially with regard to the annual benchmarking, perhaps. Um, but this is pretty close to um, what we're assuming on the CIP side, and I'm guessing uh, you know probably on the operating side as well. Um, uh, the other thing I did want to note is, and I included in the packet uh, some discussion, uh, some comments from the Choose Clean Water Coalition, which provided comments uh, to MDE uh, on the, uh, the broader sort of Maryland perspective. Uh, and they, they have some you know, significant criticisms of the, um, uh, the, the structure of the permits uh, and also specifically the uh, um, uh, the rate of improvement, if you will, that the permits call for. So uh, that I've included some comments and also a, a link to the letter that they sent. Um, but I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that as the public comment period goes forward um, about uh, their concerns about the um, uh, how the permits are structured and how much work is required in them. Uh, so that's, you know, some it's important to understand that pushback coming from the environmental community with regard to this. Um, but I think with that, I think we should just sort of open it up to questions uh, now and see see what uh, areas councilors would like to have further information. Terrific. Um, well, this is a big milestone. It's great to be getting this briefing. Uh, we've waited a long time for it. Frank, how many uh, acres of uh, impervious surface did you say we still have in the county? Uh, there's 30, around 35,000, so I think about roughly half of that have been treated. And that number still needs to be updated, obviously, continues to increase. Right. Um, sorry, but so if I'm dividing, that's what I thought you said. So if I'm dividing 1814 by 35,000, I don't get 9.6%, I get 5. Right. So... That's the total amount of impervious surface. The total amount of untreated is about half of that. Ah. So it's about 18,000. I'm sorry. I realized as soon as I said the 35,000 number, it would be right. confusing because that's the total number and what's treated is a subset of that. So. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's an important number, but not the only important number. Okay. That's so right. it's, it's amazing that, I mean, the public should know you've, you've now treated 50% of the impervious surface in the county? Well, I mean, between us and also as new development occurs, they're required to treat it. And the state and WMATA and right. MTA and all those partners, but that's pretty remarkable, right? It is. Are we yeah. way ahead of nearly every county in the nation on that? I don't know. Uh, Kate, do you know where we sit compared to other... Oh, that's a challenging question because Maryland is the only state that looks at this strictly from an impervious area perspective. Other states are looking at it as pollutant reduction. And so in order to find the acres treated, you would have to dig into um, their progress a little more. What, they're, what they lead with is this is how many pounds of X, Y, and Z we've removed. So Maryland's kind of in its own little um, system that way. Yeah, but I think there is a lot of treatment in Montgomery. That's part of why our goal is lower than some of the other jurisdictions because we've already done a lot. 
Yeah, and one of the uh, complaints from the environmental community is that we should be measuring our progress on stormwater related to nutrients and sediment reduced and not impervious surface. So that certainly will be a big push, not just in Montgomery County, but statewide from the environmental community. Yeah, and you'll recall the, the last time I was in front of this committee talking about this issue, we were hearing from MDE that they were moving to nutrients. And I know Councilman Glass had specific questions about that. And that was the way everything was going. And then all of a sudden we're back to acres. So is what it is. We'll still be tracking pollutants and that will still be a, a priority of ours, but the yardstick is a little bit different now for the permit. Yeah, it's interesting. A number of the jurisdictions set up their fees based on impervious surface. And that was part of the reasoning that MDE gave to not make that shift to nutrients and sediments. So. Other questions? Sounds muted. I, I was muted by the host. Um, um, it, you would continue to monitor both, both ways? Yes. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. So we're required through the uh, watershed-based TMDLs right. to monitor that. Um, and how, um, right, that's that's what I thought. So how, um, our, our goal has dropped considerably from the previous one, which we anticipated. Is this, were you surprised by how, how low it is? And what was the reaction from the environmental community? So uh, two things, um, and I'll let Kate and Amy jump in too, but they asked us to do an analysis, maximum extent practical, based on our funding, availability of contractors, time it takes to get a project through design, construction, and permitting. So um, our number was actually a little bit lower than theirs, so I wouldn't say we were surprised. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say the 20% appears to have been generally unachievable uh, despite the best efforts of all the counties. Uh, right. So the idea that it went down and of course the environmental community as they should said, you should still be doing 20%. Yeah. And uh, so that's their, their role in the process. And it's still accurate. It's like losing weight, right? I mean, the, you do the easiest ones and the right. most uh, cost-effective ones first, and then it gets harder the more you've done, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. Remember, it did take us eight years to right. get that 20%. And, and as you said, some of those acreage, acreage, acreages were easier, perhaps, than, than the next set will be. Um, and the cost per acre could be higher as well. We don't know. So, uh, yeah, there are a lot of variables. But, yeah, I think to summarize, the, the environmental argument was first, uh, as you heard, that uh, the focus on impervious area they weren't big fans of. Uh, they would prefer going more towards the, the pollutant impact or pollutant reduction. Uh, but if you're going to use the impervious area, they wanted a higher rate of, of um, retro or restoration. Right. retrofit or restoration, um, partly because um, uh, they, they, of course, were very supportive of the 20% being done in five years, and the 20% took eight years, uh, right. and we've also had a big lag time between the, the expired permit and the new permit. Uh, so the, the state as a whole is not going as fast as uh, arguably was intended, you know, two permits ago. So that's also their rationale for arguing for a, a speedier uh, retro, or retrofit or restoration process. Okay. Well, I know I have a lot more questions. I might have to follow up with you later, but I want to see what my what, what's on my colleagues' minds. Um, thank you. Yeah. For the presentation, um, I think I might direct this to Keith, but I, I'm still a little unclear here on what the status of the county's own effort is. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for this permit to come through to clarify some issues, but, you know, we had quite the, um, you know, the kind of, quite, it was quite a, quite a conversation a couple of years ago uh, when we decided 
to, um, you know, shift up our focus with contracting a little bit from what had been recommended. Um, and then everything was kind of thrown for a loop as the, you know, permit requirement was uh, expected to kind of reduce the overall, uh, you know, mandate. So, but my, my assumption is that the county's program has been continuing a pace uh, that we have not slowed down. So I guess, first of all, is that accurate? So, so I'll start, Kate, you finish. So um, in our first year uh, portfolio, we submitted to them that's part of the permit. We, most of the work in there is being completed or in design and construction and will be done the first year and it will get us to over 50% of our total permit goal for the next permit. So we've been doing a great job moving the ball in advance of this permit. We have not sat around and waited uh, despite the lack of guidance uh, from NDE. And uh, so I think we have a great start. And then if you want to talk about the new contracting, that's another conversation, but I'm glad to touch on that if that's your question. Yeah, if, if you recall, uh, Councilor Bereemer, the DEP had a lot of projects that were in progress uh, at, the, at the conclusion of the last permit and at the conclusion of uh, uh, the county meeting the requirements of the last permit in December 2018. Um, the contracting process was put on hold, but there were a lot of projects that were already uh, somewhere in the design process and ready to move forward. And DEP went ahead and did that under the more traditional approach um, that had been discussed as well, that not everything was going to be done under the, under the new um, uh, uh, contracting approach. Um, but a lot of it was, uh, but since that was put on hold, uh, they went back to the projects that were the, the, um, uh, the most ready and they moved forward with those. Uh, so that work has continued and they will get credit for that under the new permit. Right. So now the big question, I guess, that is not yet resolved is what are we going to do for the next half of our requirement and that, is that right? right? Yeah, the contracting process is something that DEP has been uh, working on over the past year. I, I think it's fair to say there's still an interest in, in modifying the process, but they've been trying to tailor it closer to how they expected this permit to come out uh, and also address some other um, issues that, uh, that were not covered under the old contracting approach. And, and I think that's, that's where they'd like to come back um, for a, a future discussion um, in the near, you know, an, in the near future, not too far off, but um, we don't have a, we don't have um, uh, slides for that discussion today. When do we expect that we'll be able to get to that? Um, that's what DEP mentioned in, in its last slide. I think uh, within the next couple months, I think, Frank. I mean, yeah, I mean. Clear, you could have been working on the, we, we could have a new contracting model now. We're not required to wait for the state. Right, to, that's correct. Uh, Except the challenge that we have is the permit's not final. We're not sure what our restoration goal is going to end up being. And probably more troubling is there's a very detailed set of accounting guidance that has not been finalized. So when we decide to go out there and buy something in the marketplace, we need to know what we're what our credit's going to be based on what we're buying. So for argument's sake, we could have bought stream restoration thinking we were going to get three credits per 100 linear feet, and that could have changed and we would have gotten one. Gotcha. So if, some of these things have been unfortunately very variable. and But now we know? Now, now we have the information we need? Well, they're going to finalize that at the same time they finalize the permit. And Kate uh, certainly knows more about the details about the accounting guidance than I do. So, Kate, if you want to yeah. jump in. Sure. MDE's approach is to release the draft accounting guidance at the same time as the draft permit for public comment. So we still won't really know the rules of the road until we get our final permit. 
which is a little difficult, but we're, we've been tracking it very closely and trying to understand um, some of the intricacies of changes that they've made, but it's been a challenge. Yeah, we talk about the permit a lot, um, Councilman, but there's this, um, but the accounting guidance is really sort of the schedule of values or the exchange rate, right. if you will. So it's, um, it, we talk about the permit a lot, but that piece, that schedule, of the accounting guidance really kind of determines what's worth doing and what isn't. Okay. Councilman, I would be more worried about this in having that contract in place if we had made so much progress to this point. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're making progress. I, I guess the question is, are we hanging back needlessly or can we be moving faster and doing more? Um, and that's that's just my, I'm trying to hone in on that question. I think, I think we do a great job. You know, we had this big conflict over contracting, which I'm afraid may have slowed us down more than necessary. And I just, I would like to see that we are not letting those issues hold us back, but we're also not spending money willy nilly that could be more efficiently spent in a different model. So I mean, all these issues are hanging out there and it just, sometimes I worry that the clock is just being run out or something like that. Um, so we've done, uh, I know from uh, the previous set of projects that we canceled, if you recall, we were saying under that old construct, we wanted the new contractor to do more than 10 of the ones that we kind of had uh, on the table. We've done more than 10, I want to say 13, please don't hold me to it. But we went back and with this delay, we selected those that were the most cost effective and efficient. We also uh, ran them through a suitability model uh, that we've developed for targeting our work going forward. So we felt very comfortable with what we selected. We also had those four projects that we funded with parks, if you recall that discussion also, four stream restoration projects. So I, I don't uh, feel like at any level that we have sat around and waited for this to transpire. And um, we've been pushing to add projects as this is, Every time it appeared it was going to get delayed longer, we added work to our plate. And the, the only thing that ultimately limits us is money. I mean, in the end, we could do, I shouldn't say this will be heresy, but we could do 20%, but it's at what cost? And uh, currently um, what's in the permit, we believe we can do under our current budget. Uh, obviously, we have concerns about uh, impacts of climate change and uh, decaying infrastructure, just like DOT projects have that may add additional costs uh, going forward. But right now, we feel comfortable. That said, we do not know what our new contract will bring us as far as bids. You know, we're, we're just to give you a few items, uh, we have the suitability model, which helps us target projects in the areas that we think are best so suited, and we can walk you through that. We also have a model to look at equity, which looks at low income, uh, high minority areas. Uh, we're going to have a certain percentage of low impact development, certain percentage of green infrastructure, local businesses, small businesses, so there's a lot of those requirements that are going to go into this new model, which will make it different than what we previously um, advocated. And a lot of those things are the things that Adam has been pushing us in that direction. And I think it's, it's fascinating. And we look forward to sharing that with you in a more robust discussion. Uh, I know you're interested in this. I don't want to leave you with nothing, uh, but, um, so I'll stop there. Thanks. You're welcome. Councilmember Glass. 
Yeah, I'll make this brief because, as I understand it, you'll come back to us after the, the open comment period. Right, exactly. So, um, just for level setting, um, we're doing we're doing well. Yeah. Right? And it might not be at the speed that that I know Councilmember Reamer was speaking about, and and I, I agree with that. Uh, but the overall data that you've just shared with us uh, means that we are doing well, and uh, I appreciate those who. Uh, we're here to introduce this important legislation and these policies. So thank you everybody for helping make our community um, a little a little bit greener uh, and a little bit healthier for our streams and waterways. And uh, we will continue this conversation after the comment period. And uh, Mr. Dawson, thank you for uh, sharing you know some of the concerns on the environmental community and Director Ortiz for sharing that the state is planning on moving in that direction. So many more conversations to come. But thank you all for this. Yeah. Thank you. Just a couple quick questions, uh, Frank or Adam uh, or Amy, on just to add a little context to this this uh, narrative um, of how we're doing. Yeah, I, I guess I would be surprised. Tell me if I'm wrong. I'd be surprised to learn that you were holding back at all because at the time that the council um, made uh, a decision to go in a different direction than the previous county executive had been pushing for, there were so many projects, as Keith said, that were. Um, both in, somewhere in the pipeline, some had already started, some were anticipated and had been scoped out and designed already that I thought my impression then was that you all had, and I think we, we were, you know, many of us were part of that decision. You all had years of work to do, you know, that was, that everybody agreed on, um, that was good and useful work to do while on a second track, you decided what was the best approach, um, to the overall stormwater that's, management, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, we, so you're successfully walking and chewing gum and now you're going to come back to us with a new recommendation. Um, um, you know, Councilman Reamer asked a very, a very good point about sort of how, you know, how, how we're doing um, and, and have we been going as quickly as we can. Um, um, if Council Member Florine were here, she would say probably something like this, that it's great that you're meeting all these ambitious goals for, um, for our community and it's great that our residents are paying high stormwater management charges um, and into the Water Quality Protection Fund to pay for all this great infrastructure work. How do we stack up uh, to the other jurisdictions with their MS4 permits since they were all, and I'd like to know more about what their goals are um, and, uh, and, and how they're doing since all of our stormwater ends up flowing into the same Patuxet or the same Anacostia. And into the same bay. So the um, trying to find this on one of my cheat sheets, but the uh, the other five four um, phase ones uh, have different uh, restoration goals uh, based on what they submitted. Uh, Baltimore City and Anne Arundel County have the highest requirements. I know. Kate, I feel like you're looking at that chart. Um, and um, Baltimore City's is primarily focused on street sweeping. And the run of counties was increased because uh, their stormwater management and uh, sewer are in the same office. So they increased, MD increased theirs because they can trade, which I'm looking at the trade. <laughs> But anyhow, so the average across the state is of, of those five jurisdictions is a little bit more than 10% and ours is 9.6. So, and and I, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Frank. Well, no, please. Just in comparison, Anne Arundel and Prince George's County have not met their per permits requirements. They didn't meet 20% yet. So part of their plan is for Anne Arundel, they did the trading, but they also have to meet the 20% plus the new 10%. Um, and so that was added on. Prince George's County, we believe, is in the middle of a consent decree negotiation right. on their permit. So I'm not sure what their new requirement is going to be because of the consent decree requirement. Baltimore County, Baltimore City, and of course Montgomery County met the 20%. So now they're adding on the additional 10% on average across all the jurisdictions, the first, the phase ones. Um, the first five. Then there's another five that are going to be added on Howard, Frederick, Carol. Yeah, so those two, they come out a year later. So they're going to start working on them now. 
and anticipate the same requirements, the same 10%. Um, they, the MDE justified the 10% based on the phase three watershed implementation plan for the Bay TMDO, where they said on average, jurisdictions can achieve 2% per year. Right. So they felt that was one of the reasons why they increased our rate from what we had presented to them to what it is now, because they felt we could achieve the, the that amount based on what we previously had achieved in our past permit and the practices we had put in place. They felt we could achieve that. So that's how we got the 9.6 um, and why most of the jurisdictions saw an increase. Uh, and right. they, they think the jurisdictions can use trading and they use that as justification. Plus they added a lot more practices to the county guidance that they think we can use, which was another justification they gave for increasing. Um, and they wanted to see more jurisdictions doing that work. So, um, but as we stack up, because we completed, we're into our next phase. Some jurisdictions are not gonna have that and they're gonna have to complete their past permit as well. So they all ended up with close to the same goals going forward. We got some credit for the reasons you stated um, and those who didn't yet meet their 20% goal still have to do that first. That's right. You don't get forbearance on that, good. Right. Um, and there's more counties going online with a new MS4 permit you meant, that you mentioned. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they came a year later, so their permits are gonna be due. Yeah. You know, they chose to focus on the five phase one large jurisdictions. The next five are the medium sized jurisdictions. And um, so they'll really, I don't know if they've given us a timetable for when those permits will be released, but I know they're planning on working on them almost immediately. Hey, do we know anything about DC's goals? Um, we know a little bit. It's again, different because they don't do IA. Um, they have some goals like tree planting and they're, mm -hmm. um, I think they have a market for trading treatment credits, mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of a different language from Maryland. We can get you more information on that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and their situation is a little different. Their their primary um, issue is the combined sewer sewer overflow, yeah. and uh, and the, the sewage. Um, and uh, you know they've made a lot of progress on the new tunnel program that I know you're familiar with. So it's um it's a little bit little bit apples and oranges. They, they still have green infrastructure program, but it's not going to be the driver for improve like uh, the the new sewer system will be. Right. What's the timeline on that? Uh, the 2028, I think, team. Wow. They're, they're done with phase one. They're on phase two now, and I think there's a third phase that completes in 2026 or 2028. Wow, okay. Yeah. Uh, any, oh, and what's the status of the salt management plan? We raised this in this committee before, and then we found out you already had a new requirement on that. Well, is that, that in, the, in development? The, it is in development. I mean, we our, our county has had a salt management plan in place, um, and now uh, the new requirement is, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we have to have a plan in place by year four, so now we just have to look to see um, if our plan is meeting state requirements, which is what, what the requirement under the new permit is. But um, in addition to our road salt, we have to look at the other um, components of the county, which would include um, what, what we're doing with our parking lots and sidewalks. Um, what schools is doing, you know, um, in addition, uh, commercial uh, and residential outreach. So it's going to get expanded beyond what um, our, our road salt management plan is. Right. And MD is really stepping up there to help us yeah. develop training programs for private applicators. So that's going forward now, um, even though our salt management plan won't be due under the permit for three or four years, there are efforts going on now to re reduce salt application. Right. Um. Just my, I, I have stuff to follow up with you on, but um, I know since since Frank is here, you might remember, or Amy, um, I thought in an earlier committee hearing on this, it was revealed that we weren't getting credit for the work, the treatment that WSSC was doing, didn't count toward our county total. Did that get addressed? For their stream stabilization projects? Mm-hmm. Um, we weren't able to come to an agreement with WSSC on the credit. Yeah. They wanted us to take over maintenance, and that would have been very challenging in a lot of the areas where the stabilization work was done. Right. We also, in the end, didn't need the credit because we had had so many projects 
already. Right. So. Although we would have gotten to twenty percent faster, but so that's, that's so nobody's getting credit for WSSC's work. Well, they are under their consent under decree. Consent decree. They, yeah. Under their consent decree. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm all done. Anybody else with any remaining questions on this? Okay. Well, very enlightening. Good work. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Very cool. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Thank you members of the uh, committee. We appreciate your time. We had big discussions today, but we're grateful for your support and your feedback. No, no thanks for all your hard work. Appreciate it. Thanks. To monitor transportation.